Okay, I've got um, several different areas here to, um, to, to introduce and to start uh, the discussion. It is a discussion, so I don't intend to continue on up here uh, saying uh, a lot of things because it's a, it's a discussion. Um, I hope that you uh, have a lot of things that has been stirred in you. Remember when Peter wrote, he said, I intend to stir up your pure minds by a way of remembrance. The purpose of the renewals is not necessarily, or is obviously, not to say a whole bunch of new things, uh, but it's to, it's to open up the gospel and to say things that, uh, that we have already heard and that we already know and to have them uh, stirred up in us. So we hope and we trust that, that you have been uh, stirred up and provoked. What I want to start out with uh, this afternoon is the reason for this theme, um, the prophecies of the Messiah. I really thought there was, would have by now, I thought there would have been more said about it, um, about the reason for uh, this, this subject being chosen. But, uh, but there hasn't been a whole lot said about it, so that's what I want to open up with. Why would we spend three days preaching on this theme, the, the prophecies of the Messiah? Uh, Romans chapter 1 describes the, uh, the wicked that they change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image like beasts. They, they change it. That is, they, they made their God to look like an animal. Remember the calf, the golden calf? That's just one example of it. But they, they made their God to be something that, that was suitable to their imaginations or to their, to their wicked desires. Well, we're living in a day sort of like that. They've changed the Christ into something that more, that's more suitable to their purposes, more suitable to their likings. A Jesus that wouldn't clear the temple out anymore. A, a Jesus that wouldn't say, woe unto you Pharisees anymore. They've changed the glory of the incorruptible Christ into another image, into something that he is not. Jesus, the work and person of Jesus, has been changed into a personal assistant. What is it that you need? Jesus can help you to do that. The work and person of Jesus has been changed into a helper of any and all. You remember the real Jesus refused to help some people. A brother came to Jesus and said, Tell my brother to split the inheritance with me. This isn't fair. Remember what Jesus said. Who made thee a ruler and a judge over me, over you? Well, I guess technically he was. He was king of kings and lord of lords. He, he just refused to have any part of it, any, any part of that issue. But today we're have, we're, we have a Jesus presented to be a, a helper of any and all for any reason. The work and person of Jesus has been presented to be a restorer of normality. If your life is, if your life is being disturbed in any way, then Jesus can, can restore that. Well, actually, Jesus promised us that when he comes to a person, he might actually disrupt some things. He might be the cause for abnormality. <laughs> he said a, a, uh, a daughter will be against her mother. Is that what he said? And a father against his son. The, man of, the, the members of a man's own house will be his enemies. That's what Jesus said. But the image of this incorruptible Christ has been changed into something else. Now, I'm not, I'm not uh, ignorant about this, that Jesus can restore families. He can do that. But you don't have a promise that he will every time. That's my point. So the reason for this theme of the, of the renewal of prophecies of the Messiah is to hold up a standard so that the real Christ can be defined. Remember, Jesus asked a question, who do... Who's, who, uh, who is the Christ? Whose son is he? And they could give an answer. They said David's, the son of David. There, there were promises uh, that indicated that the, the Messiah would come from the lineage of David. God gave indications where he would come from. God gave indications what city he would be born in. Remember the scribes and Pharisees when Herod asked them, where will the Messiah come from? They said Bethlehem of Judea. They knew, because the prophets foretold it. Why did he do that? So that when he did come, he could be identified. 
if somebody said, well, here's the Jesus, he, he's the third child of, a, of an Italian family born in Greece. Well, we could easily say, that's not the Messiah. Because he would be born of a virgin, he would be born in Bethlehem of Judea, of the house of David. All these things went before the birth of Christ so that when he came, he could be identified. That's the reason for such a theme as this. So when somebody says, lo, here is Christ, well, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits to see whether they be of God. When somebody says, here's the Christ, Jesus can do this for you, this is who Jesus is, well, you can put it to test. Try the spirits. How do you try it? You try it by what is revealed about Jesus. That's how it's revealed. That's how you try it. And we try it by the prophecies that went before. If God were not real, and if truth were not absolute, then we would have liberty to create our, a God according to our own liking. In fact, we really wouldn't even need a God. We could just declare ourselves our own gods. But the thing is, is that we are living in a, our total existence is, is the creation of and the product of a real God. And he has defined himself. One of the things that, that the brethren in this room have in common, the, 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 all of those of you that I know, is that you're not content with a fabricated religion. You want truth. You want what is real, and you're not satisfied with something less. I know I am not. Ever since I was young and I began to hear about God, I was not content to just have any God. I wanted the real God. And I can also testify to this, and it'll bear witness in your own experience also, is that there isn't any satisfaction in a God that is not real. Because if God isn't real, then he doesn't have power. Then he, you don't find your purpose in a God who isn't real. We were created in his image for his glory. We were created to exist forever with him. And to have something less is to fall short of the very thing that we are and the purpose for which we're created. And we will feel the deficit. We will know the spiritual poverty of that condition until we find the one true living God. And because of his kindness and because of his own nature and because he is calling us to the knowledge of himself, he has witnessed of himself. And he has been very specific so that he can be known. The reason for the theme of, uh, of discussing the prophecies of the Christ, this, uh, consider by comparison some of the things that we've heard this week about the Messiah, uh, the one who will not break a bruised reed, uh, the king who cometh unto thee on the foal, um, so many others. Compare that to something that's said commonly today about Jesus. Jesus wants to be in, part, in every part of your life. You ever heard people say this? It's very common. And it, and it sounds okay on the surface. The only problem with it is that our need is to be a part of his life. Does he re, do we really have a life for him to be a part of without him? See, so this is a, this is a presentation of Jesus that, that makes him a helper, you know, that just comes along and kind of enhances what we already have. Well, we don't have anything without this Jesus. We were dead in trespasses and sins, and we are quickened in Christ. Here's, a, here's a, something else that is commonly said about Jesus, even about the Scriptures. Jesus was always with sinners. You've heard people say this. But what about the night that he drew, withdrew himself? The several nights that he withdrew himself. What about the night that he went up to the upper room with his disciples? See, there, there were times when the world wasn't allowed with Jesus. And Jesus is still like this. So the reason for, for looking at the, these prophecies of the Messiah is because the prophets acquaint us with who Jesus is. With who he is. If, if the Gospels came first... Jesus was here for three and a half years and then ascended, and then we got the prophets. 
Then we read Isaiah 53. Then we read Jeremiah 31. See, it would have, we'd have had a lot of catching up to do. But see, the prophets went before, indicating who this Christ was. Now, if, if I were to, well, Barb and I, uh, we came up to Crown Point here last fall and spent a week. Well, we didn't require any introduction, you know. We're just people. So nobody had to come up here before us and spend a week to prepare everybody. Aaron and Barb's coming. It didn't take that. But when Jesus came into the world, he required prophecies to go before. Because otherwise we would have missed who he was. So it, anyone, any, any other thoughts about the, the necessity of having such a theme as that? I know from experience that the majority of church people have never considered whether the God that they serve is, is real or not. But a valid faith demands a valid God. The scripture tells us in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourself. This is written to believers. This isn't written to the world. We don't ask the world to examine themselves. We examine them. They don't know how to examine themselves. They don't know what real people are. They don't know what a real God is. They don't know what real sin is. They don't know what real righteousness is. So we don't ask the questions to them. But to those who make a claim, it's incumbent. That means you've got to do it. It's incumbent on you to examine yourself to see if you are in the faith. What does it mean by saying that? If faith isn't in the real God, it's bogus. It's not real. It won't save you and God won't honor you. And God and Christ are so obscure to flesh that Jesus said, no man knows who the Son is but the Father. And no man knows who the Father is but the Son. And he to whom he wills to reveal him. That's Matthew eleven twenty seven. So that's why we're having this. Because some of us are just not convinced that the real Jesus has even been preached. Sister June, some time ago, about this subject, and um, <clears throat> I suggested that, I know that we try to do the best we can with the subjects and recording them and getting, getting them distributed and such. But I really feel that the words of this renewal, be just simply because of the subject matter, should be put in bound form or put on the Internet in printed form so that it can be read. Um, there are a lot of books being sold right now, some of them about Jesus, most of them not, but the ones about Jesus have the particular slant away from the prophecies of Christ, like was mentioned earlier. And, and I think this would be a very worthwhile effort on our part to the best we can, the speakers, to get your notes compiled. If you need to edit them and rewrite them in a narrative format, do so. Get it put together. Uh, get some attention drawn to this. Make it available to people so that any of us who we could even hand them out or hand out the website where it could be noticed or something like that. Very invaluable because what is being preached in churches, Anna and I have toured several churches in the last three and a half years, what is being preached in there is about Jesus, but it is not Jesus. And we, the churches are going downhill fast because they do not know the Son of God. And I, I, I just feel, I sense that need to get this put in a permanent format, not just something that's archived away. I've come to uh, understand more of late that it is vitally important for us to look at things as God looks at them. If we don't see things like God sees them, then we're going to err in our way. And I, I was very much looking forward to this year's renewal because of this. Because, as I shared with you yesterday, I had experienced the preaching of a false Jesus, one that's not real, one that can't say, one that is, <clears throat> that is unable to have the power that our true Lord has. I'm sorry, I'll try and speak up a little bit here. <clears throat> but I found um, this, this, a few verses in Hosea, and the Lord God is not pleased 
with the Jesus that is being preached. And that's why we've had this time of preaching on the, the prophecies of the Messiah. And in Hosea, the Lord spoke about this. He said, Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel, for the Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. The Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of our land now. <clears throat> because there is no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. And then later on, down a little bit further, he says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, because they reject knowledge. So it is so important for us. I, told, I kept telling Brother Tony when he was getting ready to give his testimony, I said, you are the watchman on the tower. And those who have been given to see the real Jesus, we are watchmen on the tower. We are the ones that are able to be able to present the true Jesus. And when we meet together in a forum like this, where the prophecies of the Messiah are rightly divided, and we see who Jesus truly is, then we're able to stand up and to proclaim the true Messiah, and then this is going to get to strengthen people like myself. I, I was searching. I was searching for the true Jesus. And Brother Tony and Sister Melissa, all of you, I know, have had, you can stand up here all day long and we could testify all day long about how we searched and we were looking for the true Jesus. And if we don't stand up and say what we have seen and heard, then he won't be made known. And and that's why it's important for us to talk about the true Messiah. Raising the bar a little bit here, talking about, I suppose, the, the direct purpose for whatever the intriguing thought was that initially placed Given's uh, desire to put emphasis on the prophecies of the Messiah, of our Savior. We're in a strange and wonderful time, I guess. It's wonderful because we know the end is near, and it's strange because we've never walked in waters like this before. When religion has nothing to do with righteousness, salvation has nothing to do with being saved from sin, and successful living has nothing to do with eternal life. What is this all about? Where are we? What's happened? And the readdressing of this, which, by the way, is not profound, it's rudimentary. These are the basic things that we should be doing. This is the kind of thing that, these, this is the foundations of our faith. The foundations of things that, that are uh, uh, proclaimed to us in the scripture by the Spirit. Jesus said plainly, and this is, this is not, uh, I, don't, I don't know any words large enough for this, but this is absolutely profound, where he, he was talking and he says simply, I, it's me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's a great note. There's another side to that. Turn it over. No man is coming to the Father but by me. We had better figure out who this is that we're worshiping. We had better know him. Whom to know is eternal life, and of whom to be a stranger with is eternal damnation. Hence the importance of hearing what thus saith the scripture and what the prophets said as echoed. I, I, like this, I like the Acts 2. This is that. What we've heard this week is referring once again, tying these two together. This is that. And we see Jesus. He's the one. As the Grecians came and said, this is the one that we want to see in our hearts and our minds today. We want, that's the utmost thing that we can have at this point is to say, pursue this thing. We, we would like to see Jesus. Please take us to him. Show him to me. And in the scriptures, the prophets have done that and laying out this roadmap. You ever been in one of those giant malls where they've got, it looks, I don't know what it looks like, some kind of hieroglyphics, and there's this red dot, bang, right there. It says, you are here. Well, we've come to this place to determine exactly where we are. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. That's what we want to do. And that righteousness, that's what we're after. So, again, I, I, appreciate, these, I appreciate this time especially. Um, 
We say every year, oh, this is the best one we've ever had for our time. This is appropriate to say. I think it's a tendency of our flesh to see Christ as something that is small and doesn't entail a whole lot. But the Lord prepared this salvation before the face of all men. And so he was preparing us to partake of the magnitude and the diversity of his son, Christ Jesus, and just how many areas he would, he would touch of not only our lives physically, but most importantly, spiritually. Now, Brother Bob mentioned this in his sermon, but he said that if Jesus failed at any point in fulfilling the prophecies, that it would be a false Messiah. He would not be the one that was promised. And I was actually beginning to culture this thought yesterday during the open forum, but we can see by the titles of the sermons that have been brought to us that the prophecies of the Messiah are very diverse and they cover a very wide and a very large spectrum. And I remember the, the uh, scripture that reminds us that the substance of these things is Christ. He is the substance. And the word that the scriptures use so, in Matthew, I think in the first five chapters, there's six or seven references to Jesus fulfilling the word of the prophets. And that word, fulfill, is that he filled it to its fullness. Every prophecy that was given of Christ, there was nothing lacking in what Jesus brought. He filled it to the fullest. And so we see that he is the true Messiah. Brother Leon's sermon brought the summation of this. The reason it is so large and it is so diverse and manifold in these areas is because he was a representative to make God known. God was going to be glorified in Christ Jesus. I thought I had, I was, I've been thinking about as I was preparing for my sermon and getting ready for this, is a master stroke of the devil is to get people ignorant of Christ and who Christ really is. Because when you know who Christ is and you see what God is doing and how God is, I've heard this before, that, and this is no, this isn't like, you've all heard this before, but God, he, he loves you just the way you are. You don't need to change. But the fact is, when you know the true Christ, that's just what happens, is you change. God, Jesus didn't die so that you could just stay the way you are. When he died on the cross, he died that you may fit into God's kingdom, that you may be a part of what God is doing. But when you see how glorious this kingdom is and how wonderful that Jesus is, that what the prophets are speaking of, when you see this, there's nothing that's going to stop you from getting a hold of it. So I, I can see how the devil is working in such a way that keeping people ignorant of who Christ really is is a master stroke of the devil because once, once you see what God has for you, there's nothing going to stop you from getting a hold of it. Because you, God is too glorious. God has too much to offer. And God will be glorified through all of this. But for us, brethren, it is good for us to see this now. Because on that day, you're going to, be, you're going to be, want to be a part of what God is doing. There's going to be many who is going to be cast aside into utter darkness or gnashing of teeth, and I'll be terrible. But for you brethren who see it now, who ha can partake in what God is doing and what God is offering, oh, on the day that we stand in, um, before our God and, and Jesus is the real, the true Jesus, the one who has power to, to clothe you in and, and, and a, a white robe without any spot, without any, any wrinkle. You are going to be glad on that day that you know the true Jesus. And when you know that, there's nothing going to stop you. In this life, our short little life, there will be nothing. Like Brother um, Tony was talking about, he just wasn't satisfied. He just wanted, he wanted to know. There, once you see it, there's nothing going to stop you from wanting to know. It's only because people don't see it that they stay ignorant of Christ. But when you see the magnitude of the true Christ, nothing can stop you from wanting more. 
before I said anything, I wanted to thank the Lord that uh, there are this many men and women who can properly proclaim Christ. Because this is not at all a common thing, and we shouldn't treat it as so. I wanted to uh, talk about just the many times how Christ uh, was very serious about not portraying himself in a way that he wasn't. He uh, went through a lot of effort so people wouldn't confuse his role here and wouldn't confuse his person. I was considering about how many times he healed people. He would tell people not to tell anybody. He didn't want to be associated as a healer. He didn't want this to be his identity. And about when he was in the church and the demons said, this is the Christ, he'd shut them up. He didn't want to be associated with these demons. And when the multitude, when he was feeding the multitude and they wanted him to raise him up as their king, as he left immediately. And Jesus takes this seriously. He, as much as he kept point, pointing back at the prophets to show what was going to happen and who he was, He was also doing these things, but also that just as Christ is displeased when uh, people have a false perception of him, it is pleasing to him when we have a true perception of him. And just as he was pronouncing woes to the Pharisees, we see in uh, uh, Simon Peter's confession, when he asked him, who do, you th who do you say that I am? He said, thou art the Christ. That blessed Jesus. So the, I was thinking that we've heard a lot this week, uh, this phrase, the real Jesus, or uh, a false Jesus. Now I was thinking about that. What, what do we mean when we say that? Uh, we're, we're not talking about a Jesus who we've seen pictures of that has dark hair, but in reality he had light-colored hair or something like that. That's not the difference that we're talking about. We're talking about with the way God works and the nature of the kingdom of God. And as it specifically applies to our time and our day, where Jesus is, there is power. The kingdom of God is not just talk, but it's in power. And so wherever Jesus Christ is present, wherever he is acting, God honors that because it's his son. So there's going to be something happening there something good. Whatever the scriptures say are going to happen, that's going to happen there, period, if Jesus is there. And so we, we look around us today and we see places, well, the scriptures say this, but it's not really happening here in my church, or it's not really happening in my neighbor's church, or these, the church I visit, or whatever. It's, I don't see that happening. If the power's not there, Jesus is not there. My advice is get out, because God's not there. And if God's not there and Jesus isn't there, there's no reason for you being there. That You're not going to get any benefit out of it. That's, now, this is my own conclusion. I'm not proud of it. It took me 15 years to come to that conclusion. But it, that's, that's the nature of the kingdom of God. That's the kind of fruit we're looking for. That's the difference we're talking about when we say real Jesus, false Jesus, is if, if if the truth isn't being proclaimed, if people's lives are not being transformed, totally changed, not just behavior, if they're not totally changed, that's the, the real Jesus isn't there. He's not being preached. There's something wrong there. Uh, I wanted to share with you some things that I was thinking of. Um, when Sister Amy Sins came up, I was, think, I was glad to think that when we are in a trial, the Lord is merciful to us and doesn't give us more than we can bear. If we are in Christ, we can say the Lord can help us get through this trial. I was thinking of when Brother Bob came up that we were aliens to God. Well, God turned us around and now we are aliens to the world. And... And lastly, I was um, thinking of also, I love the renewal because here there are brethren there that love the Lord and are laboring together, sharpening one another as iron sharpens iron. 
for the Lord, I am reminded of how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. I am looking forward to the rest of this renewal and next year, if the Lord tarries. And that's what I have. Um, the question was asked, uh, why the importance of emphasizing on the uh, prophecies of Jesus Christ? And a couple of the messages uh, brought out... Uh, Brother David Maddock mentioned, uh, he brought up John 21, 15, where Jesus said to feed my sheep. Another message uh, from Brother Mike Blakely, Haggai 2, 4, work for I will be with you. The Old Testament prophecies were all for the Israelites to know when Jesus was to come and become the king. It's also for us to know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. But there's also another prophecy, the prophecy of Jesus' second coming. And that's the prophecies that we can hold on to dear. Paul refers to our life as running a race in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Running a race is not easy, especially long distance. At one point, you feel like just stopping and giving up. Another point, you feel like throwing up. You know, the prophecies of Jesus' second birth, it's like Gatorade in this race. We are going to win, brothers and sisters. We're running this race. And when we feel like giving up, when we feel like it's enough, I can't handle it anymore, God gives us his prophecy of Jesus' second coming. And we know that in that time, we're going to have a, uh, a crown, an uncorruptible crown. That's what we're striving for, brothers and sisters. And that's the importance of this second coming, the prophecies, what we have to hold on to. You know, it's not like just running a race. Our race that we're running now, we're running blindly. Hebrews 11.1 1 says faith is a substance of things hoped for and evidence of things not seen. When you're running a normal race, you're able to see where the hills are at. You're able to see where the obstacles are. But ours, brothers and sisters, ours is in the dark. Because the rules, the, 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 what God has planned out for us is to not see the future. When there's a hurdle or something thrown in front of us, we don't see it. That's why we need faith. That's the importance of faith, to hold on to Jesus Christ, to hold on to what God has given us. And he says, not to be conformed of this world, but to be transformed, which is proof of these obstacles and these hurdles that we need to be aware of and stay away from so we can be transformed into Jesus Christ himself. So I just want to say that these prophecies, this weekend, this, uh, this week of uh, the refreshing waters, let's take it, let's fill our lamps, and let's be prepared for the second coming. Of Jesus. Thank you. I want to say two statements that are um, somewhat interrelated, and uh, then I'll give you a scriptural example of, of what I'm affirming. One thing is uh, the things of God, they're obtained and retained through the vehicle of understanding. That's how they are. Uh, let me say the same kind of thing a different way. Divine fellowship is realized through means of understanding. If we don't understand the Christ, we are not in fellowship with the Christ. Okay, now here's an example of that. The Son of God has come and has given us an understanding in order that we might know him that is true. And we are in him that is true. That this is the true God and eternal life. Okay, in another place, in that same letter, he says, He that hath the Son hath the life. How do we know we have the Son? Because we understand the Son. That's how. How do we know how we have the life? Because we understand the Son. Now here's an implication of that. If, if what's happening in the contemporary pulpit as what we've affirmed is true, think of the ramifications of a multitude of people who claim to be Christians who really don't understand who the Son is or why he came. We really have a people on our hands, honestly, that don't have the sun. All right? Now, that's the seriousness of it. <laughs> so what we do actually here is, 
There's another text that encourages us to lay hold on eternal life. So when we preach and we clarify the Son to one another, what we do is we enable one another to get a firmer grip on eternal life. And that's what it's all about. Several thoughts had come to mind, but I'd like to put two or three of them together. Brother Michael mentioned uh, sometimes you just have to walk off and get out. And my past people have always wondered, well, what is the marks of a true church? And of course, they would proofread text and come up with a list and I decided I'd better find my list because I was having trouble with some of their lists. It, well, one problem, all their lists were different, and so I, I was having a little trouble there deciding which to pick from because if I picked that one, you you didn't get out, Mike, they kicked you out. See? So you had that problem, so you want to be careful. I decided I'd pick something that Paul picked. So uh, I chose Philippians, the third chapter, third verse. Paul had the same problem, you know, uh, he is deviling him about not having the right marks, and so he decided, now here's the true marks, you know, circumcision mark, he used the word circumcision there, here's the true marks, those that worship God and the Spirit, glory in the Lord Jesus Christ, and put no confidence in the flesh. I got to thinking about that glory in the Lord Jesus Christ. What that is, is that's a congregation that reveals Christ to its members. That's a group of people that is interested in the real Christ. So he says, here's the mark of a true church. They're, they're revealing Christ. And why, of course, because Christ will, will reveal God to you. Now, the the negative side of that, because you, Paul, you people are wanting to do it, put confidence in the flesh. So he said, no, you can't do that. You don't want to put any confidence in the flesh. And I rarely visit a church that that is not where their confidence is. It's in, it, it, in the flesh, that's the things we're doing, isn't it? You know, it's our little programs here and little programs there and, you know, meetings here and meetings there. I, I can see it, so I figure it comes from the flesh. That's what you, I mean when you see it with your naked eyes, human eyes. I didn't need Jesus to see it. And their confidence was there, and it, that's a real problem. So Paul had to stress, let's don't put any confidence in the flesh. Now, most rituals are flesh. Now, even though they're good, uh, they don't have to be bad, I'm saying. You can't put your confidence there. The confidence must be then in revealing Jesus and worshiping God in the Spirit. And when you reveal Jesus, then you'll get the real one, and then you'll get God thrown in. And that's about all you need, I figure. I do want to thank all the brethren here for the accommodations and the meals and and just the opportunity to... This is my first time being at Crown Point, first time being in this part of the country. Um, I've been to Chicago, but just on the outskirts of it. But as I think about what Brother Aaron mentioned about the purpose, uh, the Lord took me to Colossians chapter 1, verse 18. On Wednesday nights at the, the church where I serve as the minister in Lewisburg, Missouri, we're studying Colossians. And I remind them of this verse almost every Wednesday night when we get together because it talks about some very important things. And I just want to read that. This is speaking of Jesus. And he is the head of the body. That's you and me. That's believers. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things, it doesn't say a few things, it says in all things that he may have the preeminence. The men have shared with us, not only in this renewal, but the past renewals, the things 
that the Lord has put on their heart so that Jesus can have first place, so that he can have preeminence, and he is to have preeminence in our own life. Throw another thought here uh, into the, the stream to hopefully stir some more things up is the fruit of prophecy. Prophecy is sent for a purpose. God does nothing without a purpose. And he sent these prophecies before the Christ for a purpose. It's God's manner to tell what he will do before he does it. That's part of God's ways. Uh, that's, that's how God's work is confirmed. If, you, if someone says this is what God does, but you can find nothing in the scriptures related to that, then we should question whether God did it or not. Because shall I not reveal unto my holy prophets that which I will do? And he does. That's his manner. So there is fruit that grows from the prophecies. Because God promised to do it, those who hear it and have an honest and a good heart, that grows this fruit of anticipation. God says he's going to do this. Remember Daniel, he understood from books that the captivity was 70 years. Well, then Daniel expected, he knew, captivity's coming to a close. Because God promised it was going to be 70 years. Uh, you remember Simeon and Anna, the uh, elderly people in the temple. The, Lord, the Holy Spirit revealed to Simeon that he wouldn't see death until he saw the Lord's Christ. What did that promise do in Simeon? It bore fruit. It bore fruit of expectation, of looking. He came to the temple every morning probably thinking, this might be the day that I, that I see the Lord's Christ. Could be, what, could be the day. And so that hope carried him through to the end. And it'll do the same thing in each, each one of us. The prophets, uh, Peter says, that the prophets searched diligently and inquired what time or what manner the spirit which is in them did signify that Christ should come. They searched diligently. And that's one of the fruits that uh, prophecy will do in, in a person that when the prophecy sticks in you, and you know what I mean by that, when the prophecy, when the word of God starts working in you, uh, it, it causes a searching. It, it, it sets you, it sets you on, a, on a diligent search to find, to find the meaning, to find the meat, to find uh, what the Lord is, is doing. So that, that's another uh, thing that uh, I would ask you to, to comment on and mention, is what has the prophecies of Christ done in you? The, obviously, they've done something because you're here. Uh, so that's, that's just another, uh, another thing. You remember Peter on the day of Pentecost, he said, this is that. I like that, Brother Danny. <laughs> they call that the this is that experience. This is that. I, it was prophesied of, and now we're seeing it. Uh, that's the fruit of prophecy. Jesus revealed to John when he was very old, his mid-90s, that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of of prophecy, it's Revelation 19.10. What it means is that Jesus is to the communication of God's mind, which what prophecy is. Jesus is to the communication of God's mind what your spirit is to your body. It's what gives it life and vitality, and it makes it gives it utility. You you wouldn't hire a dead body to do carpenter work. A dead body has no utility, no use. A word that, per, that is represented as coming from God, if Jesus isn't in it, it's useless. It has no utility. It's what we call impotent. That's why it's important to know who the right Christ is. That's why it's important, because the wrong Christ is impotent. He may sound real good, and all of the names, he may be called the Son of God. He may be called Jesus of Nazareth, and it may affirm that he was born in Bethlehem, and that he was raised up in Nazareth, and, all, and he was baptized by John the Baptist, and all of that. It may say all of that, but if he can't do anything, it's not the right Christ. For the prophecies of Christ, I think of the great and precious promises, because... Essentially, these are the promises of God to us because in Jesus, we see all that God does for his people. I mean, Christ is effectual in doing this. And then I started thinking about these great and precious promises. 
For years I heard sermons about the great and precious promises literally without hearing one great or precious promise. Been there? Yeah. Well, I note that these great and precious promises have, have really two purposes, you know, and that is to get me from this world, escaping the corruptions in the world through lust, and get me to participate in the divine nature. I understand that, okay? So that, that, this is a good thing. But then I look a little bit farther, and I see that these, these characteristics of Jesus really are mentioned there in Second Peter chapter 1 following that. And then I note that this takes me a little bit further. It helps me to make, knowing the prophecies of Christ and seeing him accomplishing these things that the Father said he was going to accomplish or that the Spirit said he was going to accomplish through these prophets, it helps me to make my calling and election sure. I mean, extremely sure of this. I mean, this is like sure foundation. And, of course, what is the fruit of that? If you make your calling and election sure, you will never fall. And that's the key to me, you know, and that's, that's why it's so precious. Brother Aaron lamented earlier that uh, he did not have anyone to herald his arrival in Crown Point. I'm sorry, if only I would have known. One of the things I think that is important to understand about the prophets and especially about our role in the world today, we may not know everything about the purpose of God. We may not know how our actions will affect those around us. John the Baptist, the herald to which he alluded, said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Verse 31 of John chapter 1, I did not recognize him. But in order that he might be manifested to Israel, I came baptizing in water. Verse 33, I did not recognize him. But he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, He upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. John was given very clear instruction by the Lord. John obeyed. Because he did, he saw what he needed to see. Verse 34, I have seen and borne witness that this is is the Son of God. He started out earlier saying, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He did not even get to live to see that happen. But he did what God told him to do and fulfilled his part in the plan of Christ. You may not live to see tomorrow. Fulfill your part in the plan of Christ today. Which is harder, for God to see the future and to tell us about it, or for God to make the future. See, this is, it, someone maybe might have some kind of a success in telling you what they think is going to happen, but God actually takes the things that are not in speaking of them as though they are, because he's the one that's going to bring them to pass. And, um, this is why faith is of such an utmost importance, because this is the faith is the substance of things hoped for. This is why faith, this is why it's by faith, because these are the things you're hoping for, the things that God has promised. And who's going to do them in you? God's going to do them in you. How is he going to do them? Because you believe. Now, when was Abraham righteous? After he left Ur of the Chaldeans, or before he left Ur of the Chaldeans? Well, we, we all know it was before. We all know this. It was when he believed that it was imputed unto him. Now, another Holy Spirit says, when what? Before circumcision or in circumcision? Well, we know it was before 
because it says it in the scripture. It was imputed into him. So when are you righteous? When are, are you righteous? Because you can't really do anything until you're righteous, can you? So when you believe the record that God gave of his son and you launched out on faith and, and you believe that God said he was going to take away my sins. Now, that happened for you when you believed it. And that's why faith, faith illuminates what God's doing, not what we're doing. A couple more uh, examples from the scripture of the work that prophecy can do in people. The Lord told Noah, I'm going to flood the whole, whole earth. So what did, what did that do in Noah? Set him to working. <laughs> and uh, he was going to build the vessel that he was going to float in. So it set him to working very diligently. And that's, uh, that's the time that we're living in. We're working out our salvation with fear and trembling is building your, building your ark. He was saved, saved by water. A fruit that uh, prophecy bore in Abraham. Uh, the Lord came to Abraham and, and said, I'm going to bless the whole world in you. And then a little later he came and he made it more particular and said, in thy seed will the whole world be blessed. And then a little later again, he says, no, is of your loin, of Sarah. And each time he was revealing what he was going to do. And then of Abraham, it says, he wavered not in unbelief. That's the fruit that it bore in Abraham for 25, for about 25 years from the first time that God promised Isaac until Isaac was born, about 25 years. And the Holy Spirit commented on those years and said he wavered not in unbelief. So that, that's the fruit of the promise of God, of God, of his word going before his work. He's saying, this is what I'm going to do. Then uh, I've, I've heard some of you, uh, brethren, talk about trying to, uh, I think it was Brother Jonathan, light the fire under the people and get him work, get them working. <laughs> Well, the, the prophecies is what, gonna, is what is going, the promises of God is what's going to get people to uh, building their ark. Everybody, every minister of God, anybody that has a heart for the people of God, they want to see the people of God stable. They don't want to see them waver. And the promises of God is what's going to stabilize them, just like Abraham. This is that that was spoken of by the prophets. Anyone else? times because it provokes you to think um, about how the Lord is working. And I was thinking, as Brother Aaron asked the question, what kind of fruit do the prophecies produce? And I was reminded of the scripture in Romans 8, verse 32, which says, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? So we can reason We've looked over some of the, the sermon titles, um, the king of glory that's come, the one to whom people will gather, the one who's been anointed to preach, the king that is bringing salvation, the one who will not break a bruised reed, the one who will not, or the shepherd of the flock. All of these things have been fulfilled in Christ Jesus. And so we can reason that those things that he has Still yet to give us, but as promised, will come to pass because he has said it and therefore he has done it with these prophecies of the Messiah. I was also thinking that we can see something about the Father and all of the prophecies that he's given of the Son, is that he is in great anticipation also of bringing these things to pass that he's promised. We see the nature of our Father in heaven, of how he, during the Old Testament time, the Old Covenant time, when he did give these prophecies, he was in great anticipation of the day when they would be fulfilled and he could actually work through Christ to bring his eternal purpose to pass. And so not only do we learn of our, of our great Savior and our King, the one who is to bring salvation, but we also learn more of our Heavenly Father because he being the express image of God is teaching us of the one who gave those prophecies also. One of the things that that Jesus will do is not allow you to remain either in your um, aspirations, in your thinking, in your hope to remain anchored in this earth. He always raises you up into the heavenlies. And the, the 
all of the the messages have been wonderful. I could I could say a great many things about all of them, but I think a key to um, to really what we're doing here was this this matter of glorifying God, God glorifying Himself. If after you have met or heard of or learned from a Jesus, you don't know the Father, then you haven't met Jesus because that's what Jesus. That's who he talks about. That's, that's what he does, is he talks about the Father. And he conforms us, the Father conforms us to the, he loves his son so much, he conforms us to the image of his son. Jesus doesn't leave you unchanged either. And it isn't just a change for change's sake. It isn't just to make us nice people, which that in itself can be contested. It's to make us godly people, to, to make us what he created us for. It said, uh, it, Paul wrote, Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him, according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then Peter writing to the elect, according to the foreknowledge of God, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. We have just begun to enter in. This Jesus has more than we could possibly imagine. God is so much larger. He is so much better. The light is so much brighter than any of us have dared to imagine. But what really thrills me is that when we love him, when the Father shows us the Son, what more precious thing could be revealed to any man, any person, than the Son, his Son, his very express image, the one in whom he delights. When he shows us the Son, that's a token of God to us, that he will show us who he is if we'll look into the face of Christ Jesus. So whenever he, when we speak about Jesus to me, the fact that we're here today and in such times as which we live in, where God and his Christ are not loved, they are rejected. It sounds harsh, test it yourself. See whether these things be so. Go talk to somebody about the real Jesus. And you, you know, by God's grace, you will find people who, who will receive it. But they're not going to be the majority. We live in a time of a great falling away and of great unbelief. But the fact that we're here today loving the truth and desiring to know. We're, we're really, by our, our presence here, we are declaring to the Father that we love what we have seen so far and we want to see more it it is an ongoing prayer of mine to the father to show me the son because i know i see jesus i will see the father i will and he's the only one that can show us and there is a glory that we can know both now and in the world to come brother don't don't sell god short we can see so much more now, and I don't, want, I don't want to hinder all the good pleasure of God working in me by, by faith and by the power of his grace. That, it would, uh, that if we leave, we would leave with more, more knowledge of God through what we've heard, but with a greater desire and a greater hunger 
and a greater anticipation of the glory to which we've been called. As we were considering these uh, false Christs that have arisen in these last days, I was considering all of the blessings and the benefits that we obtain through abiding in the true Christ and how these benefits are not available to anyone abiding in the false Christ. Among these are righteousness, peace, salvation, joy, sanctification, and redemption. These things are needful and necessary for our obtaining our eternal inheritance. And without these things, we cannot please God, we cannot know him, and so comes the necessity for our being confident and sure that we are serving the true Messiah. And these things are also, if you are abiding in him, these things are those things that against such there is no law. So as you abide in him, there is no limit to how close you can come to the Father, how much you can obtain from him, and how uh, much you can know him. But without that right uh, perspective, without knowing that it is the Christ, the one that the scriptures speaks of, and the one that um, the scriptures um, confirms, then, then there you cannot receive anything from, from God, um, but thank the Lord that he has revealed his son, and he has given us um, enough to, to be able to look in the scriptures and to be able to say with confidence and assurance that we do serve the, the, the true Messiah. Um, I believe that the topic uh, is a very good one, but no matter what the topic would have been, Everyone who is here would have still been here because here is where the true Christ is preached and that's what we want to know. That's who we want to know because we love him. And why do we love him? Is because he first loved us. He said, my sheep will know my voice. And I think of, of Tony's, Brother Tony's testimony uh, reminded me a lot of my own. Uh, I think many here uh, grew up in families that their parents were preachers and they were in church from the time they were born until they became preachers. Uh, some of us, like Tony, uh, we had the same hunger or maybe, maybe even a more hunger, but we were out amongst the wolves uh, and we went to many, many different places, but we knew the voice we was hearing was not his because we are his sheep, and we knew that was not the real Christ to the point that at times we got so discouraged that we were about to give up, but our God would not let us give up. He always put something in our lives to keep us going and keep us searching. He kept calling and feeding us, and the promise that he gave me that he wouldn't let me turn loose was, he said, seek and you will find. I have held on to that promise ever since I was a child. I have become very discouraged many, many times and have been left many churches and have been thrown out of some, uh, which I don't regret because there wasn't the real Christ there anyway. Um, but God held true to his promise, and he has revealed his son more and more and more to me and to all of us. And I know that he will make us stand all the way to the end. I have a few thoughts that I think we'll conclude with. I hope you see the profitability of, of uh, sharing in a, in a format like this. Uh, because as you as you speak the truth, there's a con there's a confirming quality, a personal confirming quality when you speak what God's given you. There's there's something something about that the way the Lord, uh, the way the new new man is. If you can say it, then that see that confirms that you really have it. You've heard people say, "Well, I understand it. I just can't say it." Well, I'm not sure that you understand it if you can't say it. 
And so uh, speaking in a, in a forum like this uh, has a confirming quality to you uh, of, of what the Lord has given to you. So here's, here's just some uh, concluding thoughts as we wind this down this afternoon. Is that there are, there are a, uh, diverse manners and different forms of prophecy of the Messiah. In other words, the Holy Spirit through the prophets didn't say a virgin shall be with child 148 times. He did say that one time. But then he also said the seed of the woman will bruise the head of the serpent. It's a different manner. And even before he said the seed of the woman would bruise the head of the serpent, he covered Adam and Eve's he, he, he disapproved of their covering, and he still disapproves of man's covering, but he covered them with coats of skin. That was a prophecy. Some innocent animal that had nothing to do with sin lost their lives to cover Adam and Eve. That was a prophecy. Moses was like a prophecy that went before. He was a deliverer. He was a captain. God confirmed that I'm with him. Throw your staff down. So they threw their staffs down, and Moses' snake ate their snakes. See, God confirmed, Moses is my man. He delivered the people. He brought them out. He parted the Red Sea. See, Moses was like an individual, a, a, a prophecy in a man. Um, Joseph was the same way. He was despised of his brother. He was, went down to a strange land. He was falsely accused, and then he was exalted. To save many alive. Prophecy in a man. Melchizedek was the same way. We don't know a lot about this Melchizedek, but he had no neither beginning of days nor end of life. He abideth a priest forever. He was a prophecy of Christ in a man. The law also is a form of prophecy. It testified of atonement. It, it testified of uh, shed blood. It testified of an offering that God receives. It testifies of a mediator between God and man. The law was, was a prophecy of the, that went before of Christ. A few more. A fountain shall be opened. You see all the different ways. Because Jesus is too big for just one word. The work of Christ is too deep. It's too profound for God just to say a few things about it and then Jesus show up on the scene. We would have missed it without Moses. And without the coats of skin, without the law that went before, without Joseph, without Zechariah, without Malachi, we would have missed who he was. Isaiah said, a peg driven in a firm place and a load hung on it. That's Christ in yet a different way. David said, a, a man shall be as a covert for a hiding place from the wind. It's a prophecy that went before of the Christ. Lastly, a stone. I behold, I lay in Zion a stone, a precious stone, a tried stone, a cornerstone. You see how many ways the Lord had to use this man and that law and this ceremony and this offering and this deliverance and this likeness and all these different ways just to prepare the world for the coming of the Christ because his work is so great his name is so glorious. His person is so grand that it, it, he required all this to go before him so that when he comes, we might say, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. I thank you all that have shared this afternoon. and We'll have a word of prayer to close. Our Father in heaven, we rejoice in these prophecies that have gone before Christ. We thank you, Lord, for the love that you have given us of your word we ask, Lord, that you would help us to hide it in our hearts that we might not sin against thee. We remember, Lord, that uh, Jesus said, My sheep know my voice, and a stranger they will not follow. We desire, Lord, to know more than anything, to know the voice of the shepherd. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.